drive that. Obviously, every country is different, and every country, and perhaps Tiago, at some point, I don't know if you can tell, tell us what the energy flows are through the Brazilian energy system, because that's different. Um, but this is ours. So I'm going to talk about hydrogen to start with. Um, uh, and I'm going to talk about hydrogen because hydrogen is the simplest molecule that we could think of using that um, to replace, say, a, a fossil, methane, for example, gas. And if you start with the simplest, it's the best place to start. So hydrogen, we, we make hydrogen today. Hydrogen is made in industrial quantities. 98% of that hydrogen is made in fossil fuels. Because we don't make hydrogen today as an energy carrier. We make it as a chemical feedstock. It goes into making ammonia. It goes into the refining operations for the petrochemicals. Um, if we're going to think about using hydrogen in the future, we will need to not make it the same way, because otherwise the carbon footprint uh, doesn't really take benefit. So what's the role of hydrogen in the economy going forward? And this is a cartoon from a paper we wrote some time ago, uh, and it just paints a picture that hydrogen as an energy carrier its role alongside electricity. So and we can, and one of its advantages is you can make it lots of different ways. So I know here in, in, in RCGI, in this, in this institution uh, and group, there are a number of programs looking at how to make hydrogen. Um, people talk about blue hydrogen, that's hydrogen made from methane, natural gas, or other fossil fuels. And the, and the carbon is captured with carbon dioxide storage and suppressed it. So that gives you a low carbon hydrogen, not zero, but it's low. That's what people talk about, blue hydrogen. Um, you can make hydrogen from renewable electrons by electrolysis, and we'll talk about that. Uh, if those are genuinely uh, zero carbon electrons from solar or wind, then that's, that's what people talk about as green light. Uh, and once you've made that hydrogen, you can use it in a variety of applications, and you can, of course, also produce power with it in a gas turbine or a fuel cell, um, or indeed you can combine it with CO2, and we've we'll worked on that here in this group as well, thinking about then producing other energy carriers. And here in Brazil, we have a rich resource in biomass, and that's another very interesting route to hydrogen. Uh, I probably can't read that, doesn't matter, but it comes from this Royal Society report. The point about this is to say that there are lots of different ways of making hydrogen. You can make it with gas, you can make it with water, you can make it with ethanol, from ethanol, you can make it with biomass. So all these different routes give you flexibility in the future. And that's, that's a good thing. Now, what is the barrier to hydrogen as an energy carrier? And I would say that most people's concerns relate to the cost of that hydrogen. There are safety concerns with hydrogen. Hydrogen is a very flammable gas. You have to manage it and produce engineering solutions that are robust. But that can be done. You know how to do that. But the cost is, is the thing that's always cited against it. Uh, this is some data from the literature looking at the relationship between natural gas price and the price of hydrogen. Right? So if we're making it from natural gas, either with carbon capture and storage or without carbon capture and storage, in this particular analysis, there's a price per ton of carbon, which is the price that makes those two things the same. That's 65 euros to tell in this particular analysis. Um, and historic gas prices are around 20 euros per megawatt. What, where, where we are. Now, I pulled this data off before I came. This is current natural gas prices in Europe. You can't read it, but that's 20 there. And this is over time, these are years. This is 2022, it's going up to about 180 euros per megawatt hour. This is today, so we look at 70 euros per megawatt hour. So that has gone up 13 times. The forecast, which is only a forecast, is that you know, if I look like as we come into winter in Northern Europe, we look at about 30 to 80, and in the year it's a bit higher, over 500. And that is a enormous shift in the price of gas. What does that do to hydrogen prices? Well, of course, if we put in uh, those sorts of numbers into our number here, if it was 180, instead of being 2 euros per kilogram, it would be 11. Obviously, if it's 360, it's more like 22 euros per kilogram. And suddenly, uh, 
blue hydrogen. Anything from natural gases looking very expensive. And one of the challenges that we're seeing in Europe, of course, is these prices have had an impact on consumers and an enormous uh, challenge around the cost of gas. Enormous challenge. But you only have to look at those numbers to see the change. And that, of course, is triggered by the war in Ukraine. That's the war in Ukraine and Europe not committing to source gas in Russia. And that's the cost. And that will that ripple out across the world because this is where we go. So expect that constant to go up. So, one of the technologies I've always been interested in is green hydrogen from electronics. I'm an electrochemical engineer and electrochemical processes and stuff I've worked on. Um, and so, green hydrogen from electrolysis. Now, I'm not going to go into enormous detail, but there are broadly speaking three types of electrolysis you can get. Uh, alkaline electrolysis, which are mature, and you can get 100 megawatt scale electrolysis. Home electrolysis, which are relatively new, but are now commercially available to see megawatt scale. And solid oxide electrolysis, which is actually some of the research that we're collaborating on here, and one of the reasons I'm here is because you have an interest. Solid oxide technology, okay, uh, which are not yet commercially available. Um, and these different technologies have different advantages and disadvantages. This is um, the cheapest today, uh, but it has relatively low higher high footprint, it takes a lot of space, it's not very flexible, you can't load quite very easily with it, it doesn't produce hydrogen like pressure, which sometimes you want when you want to process or a bit of a refueling application. Yeah, have a compressor which costs money with efficiency. This uh, electrolyzer is more compact, it reduces hydrogen pressure, you can load follow very well, so you can direct the cup into wind turbine, for example. Uh, but it has things in it like platinum and iridium, which are expensive. So there are concerns about not only the cost, but the global supply chain for those materials. Uh, right. Solid oxide electrolyzers are the most efficient. So these devices are about 65% efficiency put in electricity, and you get about 65% of the calorie value of that electricity. But a solid oxide electrolyzer is closer to 90 to 95%. And that's why it's interesting. That's why they're working on it. But these operate at high temperatures, and they're not yet as commercially available. But what's the, what drives green hydrogen price? And so green hydrogen price, 60 to 80 percent of the cost of green hydrogen is the cost of electricity. It's very sensitive to power price. So blue hydrogen is very sensitive to natural gas price, which is very popular enough. Green hydrogen is very sensitive to power price. And if you're going to have green hydrogen, that means you need to use green electrons, right? So it's very sensitive to the price of renewable power. So this is um, some typical numbers, historic average power price in euros per megawatt hour. Uh, and you can see that historically, typically, depending on the electrolyzer technology, because it's efficient, efficiency matters, you're around four to five euros per megawatt. And if we, if we go back to this sort of plot here, that's why green hydrogen has struggled, because historically, this sort of hydrogen for I2 is a lot more expensive. Uh, except that when it, when when that uh, when the hydrogen is suddenly uh, more like twenty two euros a kilogram, it's not a lot more expensive. Sorry, and this is some forecast. This actually comes from a piece of work by from an organisation called Arena, which is a renewable energy agency, uh, which looks at which did some cost forecasting. The price down of green hydrogen, they got it down coming down to about a dollar per kilogram, which is if you can get down to a dollar per kilogram, you are competing with fossil fuels absolutely. It's the cheapest energy carrier at that point of the model. And then that, that was their forecast. This is some other forecasting. This is the levelized cost of hydrogen in dollars per kilogram of grey. Well, this predates the rise of price of natural gas, so there's no way it's that now. It's more like up here. Um, blue, which is also up here. Uh, and green, and of course, the green cost is so sensitive to the power price. But in some parts of the world, for example, in the Middle East or in Australia, they're now 
producing renewable power at about this 10, certainly sub 20, and possibly 10 dollars a megawatt hour. And at that point, you're coming into the kind of two, dollars, two euros a kilogram. And that's why the world's biggest three hydrogen projects are in Saudi Arabia and Australia. And this is, um, if anyone's interested in this in more detail, this is kind of a nice plot from a German paper which maps out current density, which is the bigger this number, the cheaper the capital cost of the equipment is. This is efficiency, so the bigger that number, the lower the electrical energy consumption is. For alkaline electrolysis, pen electrolysis, and so on. Uh, and for the academics in the room, and certainly for others as well, if they're interested, <coughs> we in my group and in Bureau are very interested in things like how do we produce different structures of electrodes that can give us the performance and the durability we want for these high jet electrolytes. It's a subject I'm very interested in. And so we, we, we're interested in that type of thing um, and so on. Okay, so if we've got hydrogen at an acceptable cost, what's the best thing to do with it? First thing we should always do is to displace the current use of hydrogen. So if we've got green hydrogen at an acceptable cost, the first thing we should do is use it for local ammonia, for local petrochemists, at least what we do petrochemists, we won't do petrochemists with the cost of it because we can stop being producing as much gas as we use it. Um, at least not at the scale we do at the moment. Um, and once you've replaced those uses, then you might start to think about using it. And, and one that's sort of well known is hydrogen fuel cells for transport. So you're all doing fuel cells, right? So you all know what fuel cell is. That's what you're all doing, I think. Um, and I'm going to talk about two types of fuel cells the, the PEN or proton exchange membrane uh, uh, fuel cell, which is the low temperature one that runs about 80 to 120 degrees C. Uh, it uses a proton conducting membrane with electrodes on both sides when the chemistry happens. And the solid oxide fuel cell, which is the high temperature one, which uses an oxide ion conducting ceramic, which conducts oxide ions at elevated temperatures, so 600 degrees or higher. Uh, in both cases, the concept is the same. We put a fuel, shown here as hydrogen, uh, on one side, on the, on, on the anode of the device. Um, in, this, in the pen case, that uh, fuel is oxidized, it releases protons, and it produces electrons. Those protons cross the membrane because this membrane is a proton conductor. It's not an electron conductor, so it would only allow the protons to cross. Those protons will combine with oxygen from air, usually from air. Uh, and the electrons, if allowed to flow around an external circuit, will then also combine to complete the reaction. We get a voltage generated based on the thermodynamic driving force of Gibbs free energy in reaction, which defines the voltage. The voltage is a thermodynamic property. So voltage is defines efficiency because it gives energy defines efficiency. It gives energy at the end, it gives the maximum efficiency. So voltage equals efficiency. So the better the higher voltage, the better from an efficiency perspective. And as you get electrons flowing around the circuit, that's current. So current is reaction rate. So the higher the current, the higher the reaction rate. So one of the joys about any electrochemical system is you measure the current. You absolutely know the reaction rate, which is much harder to do in a sort of conventional chemical process. Mm -hmm. In an process, we can be very precise. Um, so, so that's how the, how the device works. So, if we've got a, a connection, we put it across a load, we put fuel on one side, air on the other side, it will produce current and it will generate the voltage. The voltage has current. And as we draw more current from the device, the voltage or the losses in there between the resistance and materials and the flow of electrons, charge transfer resistance and kinetics and so on. <coughs> and we produce water on the on the FS. Now in a high temperature device, the concept's exactly the same. So we're putting in a hydrogen-rich gas. Um, that uh, on the air side, we push, we're putting in oxygen from air usually again. But oxygen is um, accepting electrons from an external circuit, which is producing now oxide ions. This material is an oxide ion conductor, those ions across the membrane. Again, it's not an electron conductor, it's an ion conductor, 
those lots seem to apply over the combined with the hill, and produce water in this case somewhere else there. And so again, we've got a flow of right water. The big difference is that now we're producing water on the anode side, and here we're producing water on the anode side. So technologically, that matters quite a lot. In terms of the principles of global reactions. So these devices are high power, high, generally higher power density than these. These run at lower temperatures, they're faster to start up, higher power density, and so you tend to find these generally tailored historically for transport applications with power density. And so we'll start with time. These devices run at temperature, they produce steam, hot liquid water, so they're good for applications where you want power and heat. And because they're hot, you can not only put hydrogen in, which you put carbon monoxide in, you put other fuels in, so they have much more fuel flexibility. Whereas these devices here use platinum based catalysts, and those platinum based catalysts are poison by carbon monoxide and other reaction things. Well, not quite what you do. So, so that makes it more difficult to use. Well. So, this is our hydrogen fuel cell car at the Imperial College. It's our facility in line, which is a commercial vehicle. Nicely batched up so you can see what it is. Um, uh, and if you want to, uh, <coughs> so just, a, just a sort of flavor of where we are with fuel cell electric cars. So I've been around this game a long time, and 20 years ago or more, it was really all about hydrogen cars. Uh, and that was the motivation. I think it's less of a motivation today. I'm not saying it's interesting, probably not where to start. Um, there are two cars we can get in the UK, the Mirai and the Hyundai i35, and the new Mirai is now out, just four hundred miles. Cost you fifty thousand pounds or three hundred thousand pounds. So it's quite expensive, yeah. um, but it does four hundred miles, and you can recharge it and fuel it in about three minutes. You go up to a, a bit, I've, I've driven this and gone up to the uh, hydrogen and fueling stations. We don't have many in London, but we have several all built on shelf. Um, uh, and their shell shell hydrogen sections. And they're just part of the public refueling. You go to the same place you can refuel the gasoline or diesel or something. But if you look globally, uh, really one of the big barriers to this rollout is the number of hydrogen refueling sections. There's this tension between do I build a refueling station where there aren't many cars? There are not many cars because there are not many fueling stations in the circular issue. Shipping mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Japan leads the way in terms of this. Of course, Japan has a lot of motivation to do that. No natural reason. Very innovative with the technology. So that's, so that's cars. I think more more interesting in the near term are things like buses. But you know, we're going to there. Next time I come, I'm going to yeah, ride all for one your new hydrogen fuel cell bus, hopefully. Hopefully. Yeah. You just told me that that will happen, so I'm sure it's true. Um, and you're looking at getting some buses here on this campus, and the hydrogen yeah. fuel station on this campus, all being up in the of the city. Um, and I think what's interesting, if you look at, uh, at the commitments at COP, there was a substantive number of countries for all of them, substantive number of countries that were committed to all the EU and energy to be able to transport with zero emissions. If you follow these things, you might have seen that the UK has committed that no new cars can be sold after 2030 with a gas or not diesel. But after 2030, which is not far away, we will not be able to buy. Still have to run your old one because it's still the gasoline that keeps it going. There will be no new vehicles that can be transferred. Cars, in fact, trucks will be packed by the because the technology is very much in place. But bus is really interesting because these go in urban centres with high populations, they in air quality, and that can help them locally. Um, you know, within those city centres, they tend to be run as a public service. So there's quite a lot of motivation for thinking about how these new cars work. This car is public transport. Uh, again, you'd say that Asia is leading the way, particularly in China. Big programs on the buses. 
Um, one I haven't really seen coming, but is now really interesting, is fuel cell trains. So these are hydrogen fuel cell electric trains to replace diesel fuel electric trains. Um, so this is uh, these two these two trains both running in the UK, but again Austria and Germany will make a charge on this in the world. Uh, and they work, but they work well. They're still quite expensive, but they work well. And the question is how do you electrify suburban lines that don't come from the traffic? So main line, you can afford the infrastructure to put it over a rail, over a electric, and electric private line. But if you're not carrying a lot of passengers, it becomes a very expensive way to do that. And the fuel cells, these are fuel cells, yeah. Well, I think uh, <coughs> lots of that's your best. No, that's the best. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
of what a low carbon house might be in Japan. Um, and it's got a combination of rooftop, solar, um, generating solar power, uh, and a fuel cell generating heating power to balance uh, and, and work alongside the solar. Now, obviously, the carbon intensity of that device depends on the fuel that we're using. In this particular picture, it shows natural gas, because that's the fuel we have to get. And if you put that natural gas into a fuel cell in the home and can capture the heat locally, and this would be a, could be a low temperature or a high temperature device, because a high temperature device is more efficient, be more efficient it's about 25% more energy efficient for servicing the same needs of that. You save 25% on natural gas today, and of course, you could put that in the future if you want. So, it's also technology ready for switch or any natural gas into hydrogen, and that's what countries choose to do. And so, that is uh, that's a kind of Japanese vision, and that's an interesting vision for sure. Um, so, I've been involved in trying to develop technologies for this sort of application for a long time. Um, and the, the technology that's most efficient to use is the solid oxide fuel cell. Because if you want it, uh, if you run on a pan fuel cell, you're only going to produce hot water. That means it will be C, and it's high for C, it's okay. But it's not as, a, as good as producing um, 600 degrees C steam. <coughs> you can then catch that and go back and use it already. So I'm, I, this is a technology I've been very interested in for a long time. This comes from a review paper we wrote in 2008, which is an old name. Um, and, um, uh, and it talks about the different types of technologies for solid oxide cells. So these are flat plates made out of ceramic uh, and, and other materials. Um, and the way you think about these things is to think about the mechanical engineering. So, so sadly for an electrochemical engineer, the electrochemistry is really boring at these temperatures. The electrochemistry is really fast at 1850 The problems are all done on the mechanical engineers. Basically, this is a mechanical engineering problem working with critical ceramic materials. The electrochemistry is the easy bit. <laughs> um, and uh, so, what you have to think about is how am I going to engineer a stack that you need lots of cells to together? From these, from these materials. So there are three approaches. One is to use the, one of the electrodes, in this case the anode is the support. So the green here it means it's a mixture of nickel oxide and ceramic, and it's reduced to the field of nickel and ceramic, with a thin electrolyte on the top and then an air electrode. The other is to use, uh, and the mechanical support is called the anode, which is a porous composite material. The other is to use the electrolyte. Which then needs to be thicker. This is about 10 microns thick electrolyte, this is about 250 microns thick. The, the material with the lowest conductivity and then the highest resistance is the electrolyte. So the thicker you have the electrolyte, the higher resistance, the lower the power the less the efficiency. Um, so this is one approach because this is a more robust material actually than this, so it has some mechanical advantages. The other approach, and this is the area I'm going to be deeply involved in, is to use a metal, is the mechanical support, and then have thin layers of the ceramic materials. So that sounds like a sensible approach, but actually, from a materials development perspective, it's, it's quite hard to engineer uh, these layers so this is flat and then the corrosion problems and so on. And then that's what we can work on. So for those who are interested, and you want to ask any questions, I was involved in forming a company to take this idea forward. So back in, in 2000, uh, we filed a patent on this idea of this method support for something I didn't come up before. We filed a patent. This is a patent. That's not, not very comprehensive. Uh, but that was the core patent, and we, we, we formed a company called Service Power to commercialize that. Uh, and today, this is what where it is. So, 20 odd years later, 20 odd years later, and many hundreds of millions of pounds later, this is where it is. So, mm -hmm. and it's well, at the market now, we want to do what we have today. So, um, so that's 
So this is the pilot plant, actually, in the, the Sirius facility. This is one of the cells, as they now look to see if they've got more sophisticated. There's a metal sheet, which has been pre-stamped with the various manifolds and it's, it's really here. The shiny layer you can see is the electrolyte, which is on top of the layer you can't see, which is the anode material. And then on top of that, there's the air electrode, which is like white paint. I'll see it once it goes off. If you want to watch a video of it, this is a, an internet program. If anyone watches the Red Dwarf, it's a sign of comedy. Anyway, the guy who presented that presents it. And this is a stack of these cells. This is about a kilowatt. Uh, and those interested in these things, you know, what you end up doing is quite a lot of sophisticated material science and they all the layers because all of these layers have to be matched in terms of thermal expansion coefficient and this is great. You've got the seal design for doing that. So it's an interesting combination of materials engineering and engineering and mechanics engineering all fixing together. Uh, so this is where this is today. So this is um the stack this is um so you can buy a product in Japan now because you can inside it. Um, retail by this company, which is one of the biggest oil manufacturers. Bosch has taken a significant stake in the business and set up a factory in Germany. Do stand up putting these products into ships. Uh, and Wei Chai, um, which is a big Chinese engine manufacturer, has buses running this technology inside it, but not to power the bus, provide, it's to provide heat and power within the bus. Rather than to make the bus in the hotel of the bus, keeping the passengers warm, running into the system. Uh, and in fact, interestingly, um, they've also moved into the electrolysis space with high temperature electrolyzers, and they've just announced um, a deal with Shell to put a one megawatt electrolyzer. And so, again, we're interested in how you make stable materials for this. So, if you get something for us to Consider. So we've done a lot of work on electric spinning and producing interesting fiber structures and conductors and electronics. Um, and we also produce, sorry, this is that's an anacompasis, so I've also done throw a paper in on it, right? Which is about how do you get high surface area material with a spectrum. Anyway. Uh, and again, we're interested in modeling and simulation and Catalina, who's a postdoc in my group, in Chile, and I'm collaborator in the history of my group. So we're very interested in the dynamic performance of the city. All right, any questions? So let's change tack briefly to energy storage. And I'm going to talk about energy storage for the grids. I'm not going to talk about batteries for parts. I'm happy to have a conversation with you about that if you like, but basically, I want to focus more on grid storage. By which I mean, how do you balance at scale large scale renewables? How do you balance wind and solar so that the, the demand and the supply can be properly matched? Because in an electrical system, you have to balance that second by second. Mm -hmm. and, so on. and what might, technologies might work for you to do that? So, if you have any interest in energy storage, you can look at plots like this. This is a procurement plot. Find them all over the internet. Uh, and what it plants here is energy. So, this is the, the amount of energy a, a, a battery or a device can store. And this is power, which is how fast you can fill, it, fill that device up and empty it. And these are lots of different energy storage technologies. So, this is, this is hydrogen or synthetic natural gas or pumped hydro. So, these are devices that can store large amounts of energy uh, and invincible. To fill those quite quick. Then you've got things like capacitors down here, which store almost very small amounts of energy, but you can fill them and empty them very quickly. So if you need to have a device um, uh, for that can respond very swiftly at the hundreds of thousands of times, 
a little strong percentage in it. It might give you a few seconds of power. You might be here. Um, this is the, the lithium-ion battery that we have on large from our computers. The electric cars. One of the joys of lithium ion kind of sits in the middle. They're kind of pretty good at most things, which is why they've become really popular. But if you want to go to very large amounts of energy, uh, very large amounts of power, they're probably not what you need to use. And similarly, if you want to go to very fast energy storage, they're not what you need to use. They're a good thing Now, we're particularly interested in longer term storage. So, if we're going to store energy for less than four hours, it's almost certainly going to be with the mind batteries, right? So, if you want to store energy for a few hours, five is not that. And then, and then Relatively, uh, the prices come down a lot. There are different chemistries, but you know, this particular chemistry we're talking about is going to be out safer uh, and uh, we've got good cycle life. There are interests, there are concerns about lithium availability. We're going to truly large scale lithium batteries. And so people are also looking at sodium to replace lithium. Sodium is a bigger iron, it's a heavier iron. Um, and so the transport applications of consumer devices has a penalty for the stationary. So it's much cheaper and more abundant. Um, and so on. And people are also interested in talk about so called vehicle grid where all of your electric cars in part of the park storage and charge the cost of that. But with all sorts of vehicle warranty like cars and so on and so on. So I think that's a little bit of a But if you want less than four hour storage, I think you've pretty much got the technologies set. Proof for improvement, but we know what they are. Oops. If you want to go for longer term energy storage, there is more than four hours. It's not so clear. Because the cost of lithium ion batteries, if you want eight hours of storage, is twice as much as four. Or 12 hours of storage is three times as much as four. So, are there other technologies that break that paradigm of cost? Um, and this is some data from California doing a future forecast of the sorts of energy storage demand they'll need in California when they continue to increase the photovoltaic penetration in California, which is their major source of renewable power. And they conclude that basically they need about 40, 40 to 55 gigawatts of 10 hour storage because they need to balance overnight diurnal demand. So as nighttime falls, the amount of solar generated goes down and they need to go back that up in the energy storage. So 10 hours of storage, they want, and I think this is one of the really big interesting growth areas. And so things like where batteries and liquid you know, air storage compress there start to come into play. And I won't dwell on this too much, but so we've, we've been working on a, uh, a technology that we think is quite interesting for this sort of area. We've got the corporate company, the products and power, which is much smaller. So Sarah's power, which I mentioned to you, has six hundred employees now. This has six. So it's a very small early stage. Um, but what this does is it stores energy in tanks. It stores energy as hydrogen in a tank, not a high pressure tank like a tin bar. Uh, and when you want to, uh, and then it stores energy in a manganese couple. So this is a liquid electrolyte containing manganese. Manganese is what you find in a conventional primary battery. The primary battery is what you want. It's very cheap material. Um, and um, you saw this, uh, this is manganese dissolved in acid and it's hydrogen tank. When you want to charge the device up, you make hydrogen in this side and store it in the tank, and you change the oxidation state of the manganese in this tank. And then when you want to discharge it to produce power, you flow that hydrogen back through and throw this manganese back through, and it works out the So this is the fuel in this velocity. And so if you want more energy, you just have a bit of so it gives you a bit of cost saving board. Um, now these technologies are new, flow batteries have been around a long time. You can buy them today using vanadium in acid on both sides. But this no, manganese is one tenth of the cost of the day. So we think the attractions and the cost of things that come from the hydrogen ecosystem you have on. So does it work? Yes, this is the chemistry, not the progress too much. Um, and this is seven hundred cycles to show. So we're scaling that up at the moment. So that's my last slide. Um, I'm perhaps just summarizing, see if you've got any 
questions. So I've kind of charged through the world of electronic devices. You've got to focus on pure cell, you've touched on some others. But what I hope to take then is that whether it's a fuel cell or an electrolyzer or a battery, what fuel cells bring is high efficiency, what all electronic technology brings is high efficiency compared to thermal technology. So a one kilowatt fuel cell is as efficient as a 100 megawatt cell. Okay? So they give you high efficiency across a whole range of metal cells, and that's useful in the future as we start to think about a very different sort of energy system. They're flexible, they can move between electrons, yeah. One to the cells that as efficient as. Yeah. So, by which I mean that uh, if you look at a large scale thermal power plant, probably 60% efficient. We can discuss it in the kind of energy case in the room. Let's say it's 60% efficient. Right? One kilowatt fuel cell is also 60%. Whereas if you try to scale down a thermal plant, like a turbine, or any form of thermal plant, the efficiency falls away quite quick as the scale goes down. And then these heat losses start to dominate the efficiency. So you lose efficiency with thermal plants that are small. With electrical plants, you retain the efficiency because it's entirely dependent on the volume. So there's a very different set of scaling parameters. So that can be attractive if you want lots of small plants. So it lends itself to a different type of system. And of course, they, they do, electrochemical technology is all about moving between electrons. Um, yeah, materials matter. So this engineering. And so does how you make them. Uh, and there's lots of room for innovation. And there's work in this group and work in Krill and elsewhere on how to do that. And I, I just highlight this last point. You know, international collaboration is really important if you're going to do this at scale and at scale. So you can start from here. You can go to your colleagues um, and have a chance to talk to you today. Um, and if anyone has interest in what we do at Imperial, we have lots of websites you can go look at. So I haven't got any more slides. So if you've got any questions, you've been podcasting out. Very well, that's the first. Then you can. Uh, there are two very simple questions regarding the temperature of that battery uh, flow yeah. concept. Well, the pressure is around 10 bars. You said. Oh, this side, yeah. yeah, but it's, uh, in, regarding the temperature, yeah. that you have to keep the. the yeah, just for, well, you yeah. temperature. It, it will work at room temperature. We, we would probably operate it sort of around 50 to 70 degrees C because it connected to that. Then the second question is simply more uh, how do you see the future for electrolyzers with not pure water mm -hmm. but with uh, light? Tiago is coordinating a project to try to develop uh, electrolyzer with vinas instead of water, mm -hmm. and salt water as well, mm -hmm. sea water. Well, look, it's, it's, it's a relevant concern, which is that uh, electrolyzers need water. Mm -hmm. And so, if, if you're going to put them in the water stress areas, that's a difficult thing. And even the UK now has water stress. Um, in, the, in, the, in the very populated southern region, so London is okay, and then there is a water stress. So if you put them in Scotland, it looks like it flows all the time. But if you put them down in the south, it doesn't make very much time. You have the same rainfall as it is in the southeast or the southeast of the UK. Climate change. But it's a very different climate. So, and so water stress is a relevant concern. Um, particularly around fresh water. So I think it's a very good question, which is how do you access brackish water, mm -hmm. so down water, and so on. You do need to put clean water into your electrolyzer. So you would have to purify it. Um, the way that's done at the moment is with any of the places, which obviously has, has cost and has some energy consumption. Um, 
the feedback for the SOFC provisors? Oh, well, okay, good question. I don't think it's as well. I think, I think putting in saline is just, you know, it's got chlorine in there, right? You're not, you're not a Victorian. Yeah, yeah. It's got yeah. chlorine in there as well. So, um, I think in the winter, definitely. Yeah, yes. I'm using saline, definitely. I think it's corrosive. And you'll make chlorine in the sun. Yeah. So you don't want that. Um, uh, if you're putting in brackish water, my, my guess is that you would probably still end up cleaning up the water. Lots of it. Really, yes. You would use hydrogen and clean the water. Okay. Um, the actual efficiency balance is only a couple of percent. It's more about the space and the cost of the efficiency. And the efficiency is the And it's not a question, it's a comment. Regarding your beginning of your presentation, I was doing some calculations regarding our ethanol plants with this hydrogen. It's about seven liters per uh, kilo of hydrogen. At the current price in Brazil at the, uh, at the ethanol plant, probably is three reais per liter. And then it is the 20 reais per kilo. That's for so, 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 three, three, well, dollars. 3.5 to 4 US dollars per kilo. Yeah. But with that, we need organization. This is the starting point. Uh, this is. Yeah, so, so that puts it at a sort of blue hydrogen price through the sun upside. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. But, um, yeah. I mean, I think there's a real challenge for the blue hydrogen. Yeah, well, then it will be an advantage to um, do something like that. Well, I agree with you that well, you have the experience that you, you start working with yourselves a little bit, the other way, a couple of years ago. With the uh, SOFC reform of ethanol, which is for me, uh, and that's the, uh, you know, it's an issue that's probably is going to bring that. Price down. So, anyone else with any questions? So anyone want to go the tools on industry and got any questions? If you have got any questions about any of this, uh, and you've got any technical questions, I hope not that slide of advice. Gustavo, Gustavo, you know, Gustavo. Yeah, no, Gustavo was mentioned about the uh, amount, you mentioned about reversible, reversible cells. And I know that uh, if you go for some oxide based uh, fuel cell efficiency, it's quite high in the round three. Yep. So I remember I was mentioning about uh, okay, the high efficiency of the left solar type electrolyzer and the fuel cell. And that's a really interesting uh, life cycle. Uh, yeah, I mean, the electrolyzer is 90% efficient. You can actually make them over 100. I remember the music which is cheap because it's always the opposite to the thermal work of the mm -hmm. uh, well, it's, um, because it's an endothermic device, you can do it with great speed and so But you only count the electricity because I don't have it. It's not really a good time. But it's still very high. And then in it feels somewhere at 60%. So 0.9 by 26 or 54. Whereas a low temperature system is more like 65% electrical, the, sorry, the, the electrolyzer, 60% for the fuel cell, so it's more like 26. Okay. Well, this concept is very interesting because you you have the mechanical device, there is a pump, not a compressor. And yeah. this is what. Yeah, and we'll you, you, you might, I mean, there's a question around how you compress this, and so you. you Plan to use our extended compression okay. on this side, but this is just oh, yeah, no, this is just uh, an interesting but it's something that's going down. Okay. And this gives you a range of efficiency of about 75%. Mm -hmm. So it's only an energy store, it doesn't produce a chemical company, and there's an electrolyzer that makes both and it's not going to be a it's also an energy store, and its efficiency is not This is this both energy. Effectively, you're replacing the slow oxygen reaction in the more than that. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
deserve the shell being changed. Yeah, but we're in the shell of yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Sorry, I'm going to get this guy started. Yeah, yeah, yeah sure. sure. Uh, it's just the world of the name of the company. Accelerates our CERES and size here in the real. You know, Yeah, I think you to get some Yeah, you should reach out to them. And if you want to to I can't, I, I don't know the company, so I don't say because of the But uh, I'm just an advisor, But um, I can make an introduction. <laughs> Maybe you can do some of the bits you know, about the dual scheme in Germany yeah. for us to take more yeah. German students yeah. in the near future. Which, uh, which German university do you need here uh, to the German for Yeah. Which German university? That is just the university. Okay. Yeah. 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 And now I'm going to write my application slide from the information, but did you not say about airplanes? I just want to slide. It's a really good point. I haven't got one because I haven't got a slide. Yes. So there are, there are some companies thinking about hydrogen aircraft. It's a company from Zero Avia who are looking like, at hydrogen fuel cell aircraft. Uh, and in fact, I am um, not a non executive director of another company looking at liquid hydrogen. It's a metric energy group. They're all quite small companies. Um, but the, the big aircraft manufacturers, you know, Airbus and Boeing, and people are looking at hydrogen as an option. I think there's a debate about whether you have it in a combustion engine or so on, or in a fuel cell. Because the fuel cell is so much more efficient, then you need less hydrogen, which is good. Uh, but the challenge is you need very high calories in the fuel cell. So significantly higher than the hydrogen. Um, and so the question is how do you engineer those high calories in fuel cells? Um, and there's what I'm going on to think about that because, it's, because it becomes an aviation application, you can think quite differently than you can in the car or the bus. Yes. Okay. I think about the protein is more different because of what it's also protein is. Um, and so you know, we're doing some work on that as well. But that's really about the need to be technology. Because that's the area of services that are next to the world. So you're right, it is an area of interest. There's, there's the question is what fuel in that case is hydrogen probably won't be the So it's got to be and liquid is has the same challenges But certainly if you do the sums and you get that right, um, you, I don't think you'll fly from I don't think you would fly from Brazil to the UK. Um, I think you probably need to use a liquid synthetic. But to fly to Rio or for us in Europe to fly between the UK and Germany. That I mean, I'm still the hub. Spoke, so, spoke twice. So, it's, it's, a, it's an open question. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, the, the debate is whether you go with a synthetic liquid fuel, which you need hydrogen to make, um, but you pay a penalty, and the, the amount of energy you need to put into that fuel to make is much, much higher. So, you need a lot more electrons. But it's once it's there, it's a little bit of it's more protection for you to store it on the plane and burn it in the So it's really around that trade off between the, um, the cost of the fuel, the energy intensity of the fuel, and the function of the fuel. Okay, so it's the same appeal for ships and water vehicles. Yeah, so I did. I, I've got a picture on, on, on Marine, you're right, it's another interesting 
fights in my brain. Um, so I, it's hard to feel like I'm writing it out to get back to the world. You said that particularly it's a very similar way that well, firstly, you try not to let it escape. So the first job is to keep it intact. Um, the, the challenge with hydrogen is that it has a very high um, explosive rate. So, uh, uh, so it, it, it ignites you know, the explosion in quite a wide range of concentrations. But the, the positive is that it drives the air. So that if it does escape, and it's not it, it will be diffused by very much. And so actually, it's the same with the gasoline. Now, it's, it's gasoline leads to a pool, vaporize, and then it's wet. The hydrogen leads to the world, and the temperature is different. The challenge comes inside because it flies to the air, so it's gathering three points. So if you need to take a band, for example, and you're storing hydrogen, giving ventilation, people are doing thinking about whether there are hydrogen trucks starting to tunnel. Safe ventilation is a problem. So it's like engineering solutions to manage that. And it's entirely doable. What are the degradable parts of the two cells? How do you compare the how do you manage the Something yeah, so it's a very good question. So everything degrades, right? Yeah. So the question is around understanding the difference between degradation and failure. So um, all of these devices, batteries, everything we own, everything we have is great when we use it. Um, so the materials will change characteristics, the conductivities will slowly go down, things move around, there's some corrosion. Uh, but all of that is, again, reasonably well understood and managed now. Um, they're mainly mitigated through engineering solutions. So those engineering solutions add cost. So the, the advances are going to be gradually making things more stable, taking away solar controls, and that will take cost out of the system. But the automotive, in particular, have done a huge amount of work to manage that. The solar oxide the degradation processes are slightly different because it's thermal in your high temperature, but you're using different materials as well, designed to be safe. Um, so, yeah, but it's, yeah, it's an ongoing, it's, it's, it keeps people like me busy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hopefully, like this. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> okay, everyone, good. All right. That's thank you, sir. Professor. <laughs> thank you. Thanks for listening. Oh, it's a great, great time. Thank you very much.